Take your Bibles, church, and turn to uh, Acts chapter number 2. We are starting our fall series today. We're going to call it the Church Triumphant, and uh, we will be uh, studying the book of Acts. We're going to be talking about the church. We're going to talk about what God thinks about his church. We are his bride, the bride of Christ. We are you quite unique uh, in and of ourself. Uh, there is, um, uh, the church is better on its worst day than the world is on its best day. The church has many critics, but we have no rival. We are the only hope that this world has. We are not everything that God has for this world, but we are the representation of what God has for this world. If we could open up ourselves and let God be God in us, if we could open up ourselves and let God be God in us, if we could take the, the, the gifts that God has blessed us with, realize how, and, and be grateful, realize how blessed we are to know God, to be known by God, and to be able to live God out every day. Nothing more, nothing less, just Christ in us, the hope of glory. One day, I'm going to breathe my last, and I'm going <clears> to <throat> leave this world behind, and I'm going to go to heaven. I will see Christ as he is. It will be amazing. It will be wonderful. It will be glorious. I got family there that I'm looking forward to, to, to meeting. I got some that I, I just can't wait to see. But listen, church, that's then. But this is the growing of church now. I'm grateful for that then. But we have one opportunity, and we need to be about his business today. In Acts 2, you see the beginning of the church. It's called the day of Pentecost. That is the, the feast of first fruits. It was the, the first harvest that would come in. And they would take the, the, the first of those and they would be, it would be a wave offering unto the Lord. It was saying the beginning of all the blessings that would come in the harvest. Jesus was the first fruits. So Jesus said, let me begin my church on the day of first fruits, on the Pentecost, seven weeks and one day since um, Passover. Seven weeks and one day, the perfection number. Now it's all going to begin new. They were there meeting. It had been 10 days since Jesus had ascended to glory. And they were there and they were saying, I wonder why, I wonder how. I, I don't know all these things. I had questions. But listen, the, those that were believers who had seen the risen Christ, they were there because Jesus told them, stick together. Stay there. Wait on the promise. It's coming. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. And it was a mighty thing. It, was a, it changed their life. By the way, Jesus is in the changing of life's business. And they went out and just were who they were. Some said, hey, it's early in the morning. These people look like they're drunk because things were coming out of their mouth. But literally what was happening was they were speaking in tongues, languages, that they did not even know. Now, Pentecost, once again, major, it was the first major uh, festival in Jerusalem after Passover. And, and so there were people from all over the known world who were there. And get this, they hear people speaking the good news of Christ in their own language. God is a barrier-breaking type of God. If there's something standing between you and hearing about Christ, he wants to tear down those walls. Listen, as God's church, our job is to take the good news of Jesus to the world. And he's still in the tearing down a barrier business. There are barriers that we put up in our life. Are you listening, church? There are barriers that we allow in our life. There are things that get in the way in our life of us being the representation of Christ so that others can know the same God that's blessed us. God's been good to me. God has been so very, very, very good to me. Why would I not want someone else to have the same peace that I have and the same joy? Why would I not want someone else to have the love of God in their heart like I have in my heart? The world is a hurting place. The world is, is being overwhelmed by all kinds of things that are binding them down. Frustration, fear, anxiety. Angst against people, unforgiveness, manipulation of people. We need something to change it. 
and God's in the life-changing business. And he wants to use us. God is God. He is sovereign. He can do whatever he so chooses to do. But God so chose to use me and you. God so chose to use us because, listen to me now, we get to be involved in it then. It's not just the preacher's job. I'll do my part. But you see, then I would get blessing and God would work in my life and I would feel the goodness of God. But if you can open up and allow God to do something amazing in your life, then God can use you to change someone else. But listen, God can change you too. I've always said about prayer, prayer changes circumstances, but the greatest thing of prayer is it changes me. I pray that when I pray, others will be blessed by it. But I'm blessed by it. I want us in the weeks that are ahead, if we can, to have fresh eyes on God's church. For some of us, I've been in church nine months before I was born. I've been in church my whole life. I cannot tell you how many sermons I've heard. I cannot tell you how many songs I've sung. But you know what I think this world needs? is a fresh encounter with the same old God who began it. I believe the world needs to see something that is uniquely Jesus, that doesn't look like Brian, but looks like Christ in Brian. If, if, if God can do it for Brian, God can do it for anybody. Amen? And if God can fill my cup, God can fill anybody's cup. So on the day of Pentecost, Peter preaches a normal sermon. By the way, it was an elaborate but the people, when they heard it, they were amazed by it. So we're not going to talk about the sermon. Let's talk about the results that happened after the sermon. If you would, stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. Acts chapter 2, verse number 37. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off. And as many as our Lord, the, as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and all had things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate with their food with gladness, simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Let's pray. Now, Father, this is your word. This is a testimony of what you did when you began your church. And I pray that we will have fresh eyes and fresh ears. Lord, that you would speak to our minds and to our hearts. And, Father, may we have a call once again to the first works. Lord, may we see our life through the work of Christ as he performed it then and as he is performing it today. Lord, speak to all of us collectively. Speak to us one by one individually and do a work that is a heaven work today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. We're just going to look through this just the way I like to to read God's Word, the way I like to study God's Word, the way I like to preach God's Word. Let's just look exactly at what God's Word says. Look what it says in verse 37. When they heard Peter's sermons, it says they were cut to the heart. There's a work of the Holy Spirit that happens when people are confronted with the Word of God. He goes on to say in verse 39, as many as the Lord our God will call. There is a work that must be done in the life of the unbeliever. There is a work that must be done. I can speak to ears. Only God can speak to hearts. 
I can do with, like the, God's Word said, with many other words he can try to entice. But listen, only the Lord can entice hearts. And when I speak to people and they say, how do I know? How do I know this is real? How do I know this is right? How do I know this is God's will for my life? I just simply say to them, when you know that it's not for me, but it's from, you hear it for yourself. And I call it this way. It's like when God begins to amen it in your spirit. And God begins to speak to you. Almost as if he's calling you by name. He had, comes in our emotions. He comes in our thoughts. He, he knows where we've been, and he speaks to those. Many times when I, uh, I'm back there and people are coming out, they'll say, Pastor, you spoke directly to me. That wasn't me doing it. You, you are stepping on my toes. No, I wasn't. I, I was aiming at your heart. Amen. See, the only one who can speak to you, I may be talking about this, but you're hearing it there. Because God gives, listen to me now, a personal invitation to himself. People are not saved in mass. People are saved one soul at a time. God speaks to you. God woos you. God begins to call in you. And, and they said it's like a knife took them and cut them in their heart. They're wide open. I felt like I was going to explode. I felt like I had the weight of the world on me until God took that weight off me. I've had people say that they were overrun with, with tears and with emotions. I've had others say that they never shed a tear. They never saw the fireworks. That they just It was a, a, a calming decision for them. Listen, I don't care how it happened as long as it's real to you. Listen, to you, where you are. Because God knows you and God can speak to you. So they were cut to their heart and they said, what shall we do? That's a decision. God is the God of all, but he leaves it for us. There's a choice in life. There's a choice for you to get up and make, do whatever you so want to do. God, this past Wednesday night, we talked a lot about temptation. Temptation is a choice. It's, a, it's placed there before you. You can go left, you can go right. You can choose right, you can choose wrong. It's your choice. God doesn't make that decision for you. Book of James says in chapter 1 that God does not tempt anyone, neither can he be tempted by anyone, by any sin, anything at all. But, but here it is before us. God lovingly, kindly places his goodness, his mercy. He places the opportunity for heaven. He places a bounty of love, forgiveness, belonging, joy, peace, everlasting. And he places it right there before you and says, now what are you going to do with it? What's going to be your choice? Look what else he says in his, his reply. He said, Peter said to them, repent. Repent. That means you've got to change. It's a change of mind. It's a change of thought. It's a change of heart. He said, repent and let every one of you be baptized. He said, there's something that comes after, but he says, repent. Now listen, what do we repent of? Our sin. Now notice, I didn't say sins. Uh, our sin. S-I-N. Many people often say, well, I'm repenting of my sins because they are many. How many of y'all sin? That's right. But you see, God wasn't worried about the many. He was worried about the heart of one. When God died on the, when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he came to pay our sin debt. Now this is important because, listen, I'll talk to people and they'll say, yeah, I know I need to do better. And what they try to do is reform. I, I'll quit doing this. I'll quit doing this. I, I won't do that. That's because you're worried about S-I-N-S. -S, and they are many. I'm not worried about the S-I-N-S. -S, I'm worried about the S-I-N. 
in. I was born with a sinful nature. I am a sinner because I was born with a sinful nature. I choose to do wrong. Listen to me now. I choose to do wrong. That's what got me into trouble. James said we are drawn away when we are enticed, when we are allured, when we are tempted by our own cravings and lusts and desires. What Jesus came to do is says, I'll take it all. You have to repent. Not of all the individual things you do. Those things come later. You take care of the one, then he'll begin to shape you into his likeness in every area of your life. But you must come and give him your heart. Give him your sin. Repent. The way I do things are wrong. They are against God. Lord, I need you to forgive all. And he does. Amen? Everything past is forgiven. Everything that I will do today, come on now, is forgiven. Tomorrow when I get up and I think the wrong things, guess what? It's forgiven. Only God can do that. He's the the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. God will save you. and, And time eternal, it's all gone. Now, if I were worried about S I N S then every time I did something wrong, I'd have to stop and repent of it. Stop and repent of it. Now, I understand we need to be aware. Y'all hear me? But I, 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 and I want to say, God, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. But that's not dealing with my salvation. That's dealing with my sanctification. And God works in those areas. By the way, I've been a Christian for 47 years, and I got just as much to repent of today as I did 47 years ago. It's just it was covered 47 years ago. So when people start saying, well, I I know I need to do better. God's not worried about all the little acts of your life. He's worried about you being forgiven. Letting him be Lord of your life. Letting him be in charge. Gloriously, amazingly, the life belongs to him. Repent. And, And look what else he says there. He says um, in verse number 40, and with many other words he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. He says repent. Y'all remember the action words be? Be saved, he says. When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus didn't understand that. Do I have to go back into my mom's womb? How can a person be born again? No, no, no. He was saying it's a change of your heart. It's a change of your life. It's a chain of volition and will. Listen to me, church. You must choose to repent, to say, I'm no longer going to do that. I'm going to give my heart and life to Christ. And you must be saved. That's a choice. Like temptation is a choice. So is salvation. I I wish sometimes I could video y'all. Now, they're videoing me. (laughs) I wish sometimes I could video y'all. The look on your face. And during the invitation, See, what what y'all need to realize and remember is that God's watching. But what I get to see is the striving, the unrest, the contemplation. Because when when you're cut to your heart and and you know, y'all know what I'm talking about? You know, and then you got to decide. I've seen people literally hold on to the pew in front of them until their knuckles turn white. I've seen them sit down, stand up, sit down, stand up. I've seen others just sit there and almost like they were ready to start a race. People say, why do you have to walk down an aisle? You don't. You can get saved in your seat. You can get saved in your car. You can get saved in a classroom back here. You can get saved by your bed at night. You can get down on your knees beside your bed. 
God will hear your prayers anywhere. But I'm here to tell you, when God speaks to your heart, that's the day you need to get saved. You've got to choose it. You've got to want it. You've got to be willing to turn from anything. Listen to me now. Anything that stands between your heart and him. None of those things will matter anymore. You want him to be your heart and your life. It's a decision. You need to become a follower of Christ. Look what it says in verse 41. Then those who, were, who gladly received his word were baptized. In verse 38, he said, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Some people have taken verse 38 and saying, now you have to repent and you've got to be baptized so that you can be saved. Baptism is not so that you can be saved, but because you've been saved, you need to be a follower of Christ. You need to make a stand with him. Peter preaches four other sermons in the book of Acts, and he never mentions baptism again. Does that mean he's making a lot of it? No. No. You see, John the Baptist told people to repent and be willing not just to say the words, but put some action behind it. Go down there and be baptized. Baptized is not sprinkling. What they did, the word means to immerse. The picture is worth all everything. Going under the water, showing the burial. The death and the burial coming up out of the water. Resurrection, new life in him. As Jesus gave his life, was buried, and on Resurrection Sunday morning, he came back. That's what we do. We are identifying ourselves with him. By the way, even though you don't have to be baptized to be saved, it's the first step of obedience. Never make light of what Jesus walked 30 miles to do. Jesus himself identified with his life even before his ministry began. He was lowered into the water and came back up, signifying what he would do later on in his ministry. He was dying to self. He was going to walk that, those three and a half years serving others. Church, we need to be about the Lord's business. And when anyone tells me, I, I, I've never been baptized, I never thought it was important. So what you're telling me is some of the things that God told you is important and other things that God told you to do is not very important. So when did you get to pick and choose? Either it's perfect or not. Either it's God's will or not. You know where the church has failed? We've made this difficult. It's almost as if we're asking you to jump through hoops to join the church. Can I say to you, I'm sorry? Can I, can I tell you I ask for your forgiveness? And it is my desire as, as your pastor not to make this hard and make this difficult. I want to support someone when they make choices. There are people that I know have been saved for many years, sometimes decades, but they have still not been baptized. And can I ask you, why are you waiting? I promise I won't hold you under too long. <laughs> Amen? Amen? One time I was in a church and we had a short in the heating element that was in there. And I thought we were going to baptize them and send them to heaven the same day. <laughs> and I would go with them. You know, you may say, I just don't think it's important. Or, or else you'll say, that's just not who I am. I'm shy. <laughs> when Jesus went down there, he was baptized. And when he came up out of the water, the Lord from heaven spoke and a dove descended and it rested on him, symbolizing peace. Do you think God was amen in it? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. You think God had a plan? And all we're doing is identifying ourselves with him. I think we need to do more of that, don't you? They were baptized. But all that's my introduction. Y'all ready? Look at verse 42. I think verse 42 is one of the most forgotten verses in God's Word. Verse 42 says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer. Church, y'all look at me. 
This is what we're supposed to be doing. We've got a direction book here. And, and I don't care what someone else says the church is supposed to be doing. This is what God says we're supposed to be doing. They continued steadfastly. That means with purpose. They, they, the, the tense of the word means they always were in the present tense of seeking. They were always seeking. I, I hadn't learned it all yet. I still got to go back to the Bible every day. Y'all think, y'all hear all my sermons? I'm listening to sermons during the week. I can't tell you how many times I've read through this Bible. I can't tell you how many times I've read other books about this Bible. I can't tell you how many times I've heard other sermons, but I'm still reading the Bible for myself. I'm still hearing sermons every week. I'm listening to podcasts of other preachers because I need it. I need somebody to speak to my heart too. I'm still wanting to learn more. We need to continue. And it says in the Apostles' Doctrine, you see, they had walked with Jesus, and they needed to tell the story of Jesus. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they didn't. Peter would say, hey, guys, let me tell you what Jesus did one day. And they would give them the meanings and, and tell them the parables and the stories. And, and people were eager. They had given their heart and life to Christ, and, and they wanted to know more about the Lord. We need to be in small groups. Now, I don't know who comes up with all these surveys, but they tell me, and I know I'm doing the best I can, but they tell me that you're going to remember 3% of what I say. 90, 97% of what I say you're going to forget. That would have been a good time for y'all to say Amen. But I, why do we do small groups? Because when you get into a small group and it's discussed, not just one person lecturing, it goes from 3% to 20%. But hold on. If you will actually take the lesson that is learned in the small group that is discussed and seek to apply it to your life in the coming week, it goes from 20 cents, 20%, excuse me, Remembrance to 40% remembrance. Which would y'all rather have, 3% or 40%? Your pastor says 40%. You hear me? We need to be in small groups discussing this thing. And this is biblical because it says, look what it says down in verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Did you catch that? They would go to the temple where everybody would meet together, but they would also go meet house to house, small groups. We've gotten to this place where we have a building here, and, and I had to deal with, a, with a, the tax office. They were trying to charge uh, some land that was given to the church as, as uh, taxable income because they said it's not the church. The church is just the building where the people meet. And I said, no, no, the church is not the building where the people meet. The church is the people. So if the people meet in a building, we call that church. If the people meet down at the river, we're going to call it church. If the people meet at Steve's house, we're going to call it church. Amen? If we go to Andy's house and, 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 and his what precious wife cooks us something, we have bread there, we're going to call it good church. Amen? He says, he says they, they were always seeking the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, kanania. There was something unique about them that put them different from the world. There was one thing that made them one, and that was the Spirit of Christ now living within them. And because they were now uniquely different, they were uniquely drawn to each other. And they had fellowship together. And it was good. There was encouragement there. One person may be down, a next person will be up, and they can encourage them. One person may be going through a difficult time, somebody could be there to minister and serve them. Kananiah, we're not an island unto ourselves. And that doesn't mean just in the aisles, in that two minutes where we shake hands. And then we run out after the preacher says amen so we can beat the Methodists to the steakhouse. Kanania means more than just what happens here in the aisles. 
And I praise God that this is a loving church. But God says we need to be together. We need to go through things together. We need friendships. Ladies, girls need girls. Y'all shake your heads at me. Am I telling the truth? And guys need guys, but we don't believe it. We, don't, we, don't, we won't confess it. We think we're the Lone Ranger. We would never tell anybody else that we have an issue or problem. You know what that's called? Stupid. <laughs> I am one. I can speak about us. But we don't, want, we don't want to act like we've got problems. Everybody in this room has got problems. Then he goes on and says, fellowship and the breaking of bread. Now, I'm not making this stuff up. Look in your copy of God's Word. It says, we're going to eat. Amen? And there's something powerful that happens when we eat together. As a matter of fact, in the early church, there was something that became to be known as the love feast. Now, don't get carried away. That's not some crazy thing. It, it, it wasn't satanic or nothing like that. It's God's people we get together and eat. And, and see, people were getting saved. Some of them were rich, and some of them were slaves. Some of them didn't have two nickels or two pence to, to rub together. So they would get together, and they would have a meal. Come on now. And after the meal, they would do the Lord's Supper. As a matter of fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 is really trying to correct some things because it said some people were going to the love feast and just being gluttons. You know, we can take any good thing and make something bad about it. But there's something important about eating together. By the way, New Holland, we're going to do a whole lot more eating. That would have been another good time for you to say amen. <clears throat> Uh, we're going to have a meal uh, on the Sunday before Thanksgiving. Amen? We're going to have a meal the Sunday before Christmas. We're going to have a bunch of meals. And, and it's like Genesis 1 and 2, and God looked at it and said, it is good. And we're going to sit down and we're going to talk. Because we need an opportunity for the kononia to grow. But listen, they would meet together in the temple. They would meet together in house to house. And they would have meals together. And then it says, verse 42, and they would pray together. New Holland, I have done a terrible job. And I promise you, I have, it's on my radar. And I'm going to do more of getting us together to pray together. I've been challenging the deacons. Sunday night, I'm preaching tonight. And we're going to do some praying tonight. But you see, we need to get together in small groups together and pray. Would it be wrong if a group of people met at somebody's house? And by the way, we need to get over this. Oh, my house is dirty. You can't come to my house. <laughs> That's as if we're trying to do competition, right? God help us. I got a mansion waiting on me in heaven. That will probably be the first clean house I'm ever in. And it's not her fault. Y'all can blame me. Amen? Why are we worried about what we shouldn't worry about? Why do we care? But listen, what would it be like if we got together and, and, and we talked about the Word of God and we shared from our heart, and we had a meal together, and we said, let's just, get to, let's just pray. And I'm not talking about let's just pray for two minutes. Let's pray until God meets us in our hearts and everybody's blessed by it, and then we'll say amen. Everybody was waiting for me to talk about the part where they gave everything. They went and sold all that they have and gave it to the church. That's not the message for today. But I'm going to use that as, a, as one little point. Nothing else mattered to them anymore. There were some rich people like Barnabas who had a whole lot of stuff, and he just went and sold it. He gave it to them because, listen, he was now a part of something bigger than himself. 
There is something amazing that happens in God's people when, when we are one family, when we are one heart, one accord, and, and we're living for something bigger than us. Bigger than getting a bigger house or nicer clothes or a nicer car or an, a nicer job or, or going to the Georgia Notre Dame game and watching us beat the Catholics. I wasn't going to miss that game. I was there. I was the one yelling. But listen, that's nothing compared to being here today with God's Spirit. Nothing. Nothing. Listen to church. Are we going to be open to being different from what we think church is and begin to let God draw us back to what he's always called it? If you're here today and you've been cut to your heart, I don't care if you've been a member of the church for a long time. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior and Lord, you need to do business with him today. If you say that you're a Christian, but you've never been baptized, you don't think it's a big deal. You need to be obedient. It's the first step of obedience. Never make light, never make small of what he made big. It's joining yourself with him, showing that you're part of his family. Isn't that what every Christian should do? Maybe you're very versed in how we do church. Are you open to new ideas? Can we get back to the first century church in the 21st century? Let the church triumph and be alive and well. Just let the church be the church. Let all the people rejoice because we settled the question and he is our choice. Let the anthems ring out and songs of victory as well for the church triumphant. Listen to me, church. Is alive and well. Is he alive in your heart? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you are doing. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings of life, forgiveness, Lord, that we could repent of our way of doing things and choose your way. Let you be Lord of all. And Lord, I'm grateful that you're Lord of all. Father, I pray that there are some that may need to make decisions today. So Lord, you speak to them personally, draw them to yourself, give them the courage and the boldness to be obedient unto you. I pray, Lord, I will help them in any way I can. Father, may we be about your business. May we get back to the fundamentals of the faith. Lord, may your will be done. May you multiply. Your word says that souls were added daily. Lord, that's our hope and our dream. Lord, give us souls for Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen.